On this week's show, National Signing Day, we'll take a look at some of the recruits for Georgia Southern and hear from Tyson Summers. We'll also head out to baseball to talk with Rodney Hennon about the upcoming season and get a basketball update as well. All that and more as we welcome you inside the Eagles next. And welcome inside the Eagles Nest. I'm your host, Josh Aubrey, being joined by Mike Anthony, sports editor and Georgia Southern beat writer for the Statesboro Herald. Once again, we have basketball on the screens behind us, but football takes top billing on this week every year about this time when high school students sign their scholarships. And of course, National Signing Day brings plenty of people highly recommended by their coaches and by their families and by their teammates. Um, Mike, I think we both feel kind of the same way. It's a little overhyped. We really don't know how good these guys are. We should be doing stories three or four years down the road on how those classes did, but let's play the game. The Eagles and everyone else around the country feels like they had a great recruiting class. They did fill some uh, voids and some needs in some certain positions. We knew with the new offense, coming in, the new offensive coordinator, they probably want to go a little smaller, a little faster. It looks like that's what they've got. Got a couple quarterbacks, got a couple of slot backs, got some linemen, linebackers. Your thoughts on this year's class for Georgia Southern? Well, as you mentioned, a lot of guys kind of fitting the new mold of Georgia Southern, what they want to get back to, especially offensively. Looking at the line a little bit smaller, a little bit faster. Uh, going into the backfield, you've got the need for more running backs, a lot of talent still returning at the running back position for the Eagles from last season. But with the new offense, or at least what a lot of people think the new offense will look like, there's the need for more running backs, uh, You know, whether they're uh, slot backs or B backs or A backs, whatever they'll be called. No doubt that there's gonna be plenty of people touching the ball. So a lot of needs met there. We'll have to see what they look like either in spring camp or in the case of many of these guys not getting here until fall. So just a short time to prove who can do what uh, defensively. A lot of defensive ends, I'm not sure if that's what they were really looking at. Not a lot of interior guys still on the roster, but again, it, it remains to be seen who might switch positions, who bulks up, who slims down in the off season. Kind of like you said, you know, it's one thing to count the stars right now and to be impressed or awed by highlight reels, but those stars are for what they did in high school. From now on, it's all about what they'll do for Georgia Southern. Well, Mike, as you said, a lot of speed. We got a couple of kids from just down the road and some big stars as well from uh, Benedictine. Got a couple of guys from there, linebacker and an athlete, I guess you could call Wesley. He might play slot, might kick off returns. Who knows? We also got a quarterback from Liberty County that people in the Bullitt County area have been able to see for the last couple of years. Without further ado, let's go out to head coach Tyson Summers for his thoughts on this year's recruiting class think that uh, so-called experts have us you know somewhere around second or third in some belt uh, and so again for two straight years we've been able to sign outstanding classes uh, and I'm, I'm sure if you took the two years combined uh, you would see us as resounding number one or the leader in our conference when it comes to that I think the big piece of today was filling needs um, at positions uh, obviously that starts with signing the two quarterbacks uh, trying to make sure again with uh, with Cato Brown that you've got a guy with a little bit more age, some game experience, uh, and, and a guy that's kind of been in, you know, one option football from one of the previous universities he worked for, he worked at, or played at, excuse me. And then uh, yeah, I've been talking about coaches way too much lately, um, but uh, and also being in the gun. And uh, so you have both of those pieces again. Uh, Jalen Frazier, outstanding quarterback uh, in the Savannah area at Liberty County that I felt like was one of the best players in our state and one of the most important players uh, to his individual football team and their success this year uh, was him. And so obviously quarterback from a depth standpoint and a number standpoint and trying to hit the type of quarterback that you want was important to us. Uh, running back, uh, again, trying to make sure that we have our numbers uh, the way that we want them there. Feel very good about the group of people that we have in that group. Feel good about uh, the type of guys that we have. Again, uh, you know, having a guy like Grant Walker, state champion, guy that's going to be a big body that can be able to sit there and help us. Uh, guys like Speedy LaRoche that are going to have as good a film as anybody that you see. Uh, out of Venice, Florida, uh, but again, a Georgia Southern tie. His head coach is a guy that's a Georgia Southern grad and played here. 
And, uh, and so I think as, as you go through and you look at, at each one of those pieces, uh, it becomes an important piece. You know, the other person becomes, again, a, a, a big area for us in Jacksonville with Logan Wright, a guy that, uh, if I remember correctly, in eight games ran for almost 2,300 yards. That's, uh, that's pretty good. And uh, somebody, again, that's a, a big back and a guy that we feel like is going to be a, a big part of what we're doing. And uh, so we feel really good about the skill guys and, and, and not to – go without talking about obviously Wesley Kennedy and the type of back and, and slot receiver that we see him playing for us and a guy that can line up and be on the perimeter obviously um, and, and also be able to, to, to be in pitch phase and be able to get the ball in the backfield at times as well. I, I see him as being a huge asset for us uh, as we move forward and into the future. From a defensive standpoint, you know, I really think that you're talking about uh, trying to obviously replace a large number of seniors on the defensive line. I felt like we were able to do that uh, with guys both on the interior and, and exterior. And as you really look at it for kind of what we're moving into from, from, uh, from an offensive standpoint, some of the things that we've talked about in the transition for us is trying to make sure that we're signing uh, athletic guys that can bend on the offensive line. And so some of these guys that uh, we're looking at are really kind of jumbo athletes, guys that may move later on in their careers, things like that, that could go play offensive line for us. We intentionally did that to be able to make sure that we were trying to sign the best possible player that we could to fit into what we do both on defense and offense. Uh, from a linebacker situation, you know, we're really, uh, you know, returning, we really only have really one upperclassman. You wind up with all true freshmen after Chris De La Rosa or redshirt freshmen. And so what we've tried to do was make sure that we added numbers at that position. We were able to sign four outstanding linebackers, we felt like. And, uh, and kind of, you know, the concern of the position last year going into the season was defensive back. And so obviously we played a lot of young guys uh, on the field there. And so we wound up finishing up with signing two guys in the secondary that we really feel like are going to be able to help us uh, in those spots. So we re feel really good about that. There are some just some interesting numbers, you know, uh, again, trying to make sure that we do what we said we've done, which is 17 of our 22 signees come from the state of Georgia or the Jacksonville area. Uh, you know, there's certainly a heightened uh, increase. Uh, I think we signed six kids out of the Atlanta area. And then obviously, you know, Savannah, the Savannah area, us being able to sign four guys uh, out of that group. And, and obviously kind of some of the things that are going on with George Southern Savannah right now, it's a good fit. Coach, can you give us an idea of how many of these guys were guys that you've been tracking and recruiting all along? And maybe how many, how many kind would of be went new? on late so that, you know, maybe with the offensive transition? There would be uh, overall and not exclusively just to offense, but there would be five or six new guys in that in the group. Uh, the rest of these guys are guys that have been identified, I would say, for at least six months, some of those being over a year. Most quarterbacks are committed going into their senior year. It, it is a, a – guys, if you're trying to talk about it, uh, some of the top tier guys in, in, in the country, they are. It's a little bit different when you recruit quarterbacks. And for us to be able to come in and to have signed two really good players, we feel like, and particularly two guys that fit the needs that we wanted, I think Brian did a great job of being able to convey to them exactly what the offense was going to look like. Uh, I certainly think when you start talking about signing three running backs and even a, a Grant Walker that stayed with us through the transition and a guy that was highly sought after and really didn't uh, look at other schools, uh, even though he had plenty of opportunities to. I think that goes again and says a lot about what, what Brian and the offensive staff were able to do and put together uh, of being able to communicate and articulate exactly what we wanted to look like. And obviously those players uh, decided to be able to stay with us because of it. You wind up having to kind of make up your mind early on in the process. Are, are you going to take uh, guys that you feel like you can get for the sake of being able to get them sooner? Or are you willing to play the game later and hope for better players? And that's, that's uh, you know, a dicey situation. Uh, I, we've been very fortunate for two years in a row that we feel like we've been able to finish very strong um, and that we've been able to finish with the right players and fit in the right needs at the same time. There, there's nobody in the country that walks in today and says we got everybody we wanted. There's nobody. Uh, and I don't know who's going to finish first, second, or third in the country. I don't, but they're not going to get everybody they want. So what you've got to do is have a good plan in place uh, and, and try to foresee, you know, opportunities that you've got and being able to get the best people in place that you have. And if you're going after the right guys and if you've done the right thing from an evaluation standpoint, not just on their film, but on the kind of person they are and the kind of student they are, then you usually are going to wind up doing uh, having the guys that you want at your place anyway.
All right, Mike, well, basketball going on, of course. They're in full swing, unfortunately. For the guys, they're no longer undefeated and on top in the Sun Belt standings. Now it's a three-way tie right now with Arkansas State, Georgia State, and Georgia Southern, all at seven and two and a couple at six and three. So a big series coming up this weekend with Louisiana schools. You got Monroe doubleheader on Saturday and Lafayette. Women on Thursday, guys on Monday. Your thoughts on where Georgia Southern stands right now? Well, it was only a matter of time before that perfect record went away. I think most people are in agreement that Georgia Southern's a very talented team, a team that can beat anybody in the Sun Belt on any given night, but not quite head and shoulders above everybody to the point where, you know, an 18-0 and conference run was a realistic goal. And it finally came to a head, as a lot of people might have guessed it would, on the road. A couple of road wins out in Louisiana a few weeks ago. That was big, but this was a team that, uh, in South Alabama and Troy, a team that not only had they uh, beaten once, but now they have to try to beat them twi a second time and on their home floor. Both of those games were close at Hanner Fieldhouse. Both of them proved to be a little bit too much to take care of on the road. All right, so they're back in action, as we mentioned, Thursday for the women against Lafayette, Saturday doubleheader with Monroe, and then the guys back against Lafayette on Monday. Well, before we go, baseball getting ready to get into swing. At J.I. Clements, been a lot of renovations going out there. I had a chance to talk with head coach Rodney Hinnon about what he expects this year. Joining me, Rodney Hinnon, the head coach of Georgia Southern baseball team. And Rodney, right here, it's a typical January afternoon as we get ready for your season to start. It'll be here before you know it. Right now, how are you feeling about the season and, and how do things look for you? Well, we, we've uh, had a good first two days of, of team practice. Prior to that, since school started back, we've been out here working in, in individual groups. And I like where we're at now. Certainly, uh, you know, less than three weeks away from opening day now, we, we have a lot to, to cover and, and work on between now and then. But the guys are working hard. The energy and, and the focus has been good out here uh, early on. Well, you look around, you got the new scoreboard up there. You've got Donald Trump's not the only one building the wall. You guys got one, <laughs> got one up here as well. How are things going? And what was the, uh, you know, the kind of the background about building the wall out there in Rock? Well, you know, certainly we have an opportunity to host the Sun Belt Tournament this year, which we're really excited about. And, uh, you know, we're able to make some improvements uh, to the facility uh, in anticipation of, of doing that. And, uh, I think what, what makes it unique and, and adds some character to the park is, is going with the Blue Monster uh, in right field. I mean, we're 24 feet high out there right now and a little bit deeper down the line in right field. Um, they're in the process of building the uh, in-wall scoreboard that will be inserted and it's, it's going to be the old-time scoreboard that you change by hand will really uh, be unique. Uh, you know, to the to the ballpark, and then we were able to get uh, some distance in center field where it plays a little more true uh, now. And then, uh, you know, along with the wall, you know, an updated uh, video board uh, that gives us all the capability to to do all the latest things and really just uh, uh, enhance the entire game day experience for for our fans and uh, the turf we did. Uh, from the foul lines out, everything in the foul lines now is synthetic turf outside the foul lines and in the bullpen areas. It allowed us to put permanent logos in the field and display Jack Stallings field uh, on the field, which I, I think really looks good uh, and, and helped us address some of the drainage issues that we've had to deal with uh, in years past. Uh, and we're excited about opening it up on February 17th. All right, well, as for what's going to be going on inside and on the field, you've got seven position players coming back from a year ago. You return all three of your starters. You've added some newcomers as well. This looks like a team that could make a run in the tournament. Well, again, we, we are more experienced going into the season. Uh, we return all three starters in the outfield. Uh, in the infield, three or four starters. Uh, back there, uh, you know, led by Ryan Cleveland, who, who's now a senior, Evan McDonald, Cal Baker, uh, C.J. Brazel gives us experience uh, behind the plate. So uh, 11 seniors total on, on our roster, which is uh, more than, than you normally see. So, uh, you know, hopefully that experience and that leadership is going to bode well for us. Uh, we feel like we have a talented group of, of newcomers, uh, a, a really good freshman class. Uh, some guys that will 
you know, be uh, we're looking for another starter there in the infield. We got a couple of freshmen in Stephen Curry and Mitchell Golden, kind of battling that for that spot right now. Uh, you know, a talented catcher in Luke Berryhill, uh, where, where I think gives us a good situation there, having a veteran and a young guy to kind of kind of help bring him along, and uh, you know, some other guys in that freshman class that as we get going. You know, I think we'll find roles for position-wise and, and be able to contribute. Pitching-wise, you may have one of the stronger groups in all of the Sun Belt, and that's saying a lot because the Sun Belt's pretty tough and you're at Coastal in there. Tell us a little bit about your pitching staff and what you expect out of there and what are you looking for with those guys? Well, we, we really didn't know what to expect going into last year with two freshmen uh, throwing on the weekends. And, and fortunately, I, I think you saw Chase Cohen and, and Brian Eichhorn really step up last year and, 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 and mature as the season went along. And, uh, you know, you bring those guys back along with uh, fifth-year senior and, and Evan Challenger, who's done a great job in the Friday night slot for, for the last two seasons uh, for us. Uh, a couple of experienced guys in the bullpen and Connor Simmons and, and Landon Hughes. Uh, both uh, were thrown out there in some big situations a year ago and, you know, are battle tested. Uh, you know, guys like Ryan Frederick, you know, who, who's a veteran and, and been around. And then, uh, you know, some newcomers as, as well that, that we can add to that mix. Uh, you know, we picked up a, a fifth year transfer from, from Wofford and Jacob Condor Bogan. Uh, he's an experienced guy, having pitched in their rotation uh, last year, and uh, you know a couple of uh, young arms as well that uh, you know will be able to fill roles. Uh, February 4th will be our uh, spring sports fan fest, so all the spring sports will will be here. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna scrimmage beginning at 10 o'clock Saturday morning. Uh, the other sports will be up here on the concourse signing autographs. So. Uh, you know, kids will be able to come and get pictures, sign autographs, and then once uh, we end our scrimmage, uh, we'll have a free clinic on the field uh, for all the kids. Our guys will, will be out there interacting with them, and then once the clinic ends, uh, they'll be able to get autographs from our team uh, up on the concourse. We should have scheduled cards and, and posters available. And then we got a basketball doubleheader uh, right after that. I know the women and, and men are, are both at home, so. Uh, a full day here uh, on campus and uh, encourage everybody to come out uh, and, and support all our teams. All right, once again, that's next Saturday or this Saturday coming up here at J.I. Clemens. Well, that'll wrap things up for now. Stay with us. We'll have more in just a moment. So once again, a reminder that things will get underway Saturday at J.I. Clemens around 12 o'clock. There'll be the scrimmage and then afterwards they'll have the autographs and the other spring sports going on there as well. Well, that'll wrap it up for this week. For Mike Anthony, I'm Josh Aubrey. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you again next week.